After all those joyful songs, it uh, just reminds me how much we all like negative, critical, complaining people. Don't we just love to have those, those people around? Invite a big crew of them over to your house for lunch today. Wouldn't that be great? You know, the crabby, moaning, complaining, glass half empty kind of folks. They can just sit around and just find the, the negative in everything. Those are just great people, aren't they? No. You know, those are the kind of people we try to avoid. If we thought about it very long, we'd realize those are the kind of people we need to make sure that we never become. I mean, uh, there's so many reasons to avoid that perspective on life. The uh, world can even figure that out. Non-Christians at UC Davis got together, did a study on trying to uh, analyze this human uh, tendency to be uh, negative and critical. They uh, focused their study on one remedy to it, and that was to be grateful. They found that they could get people to list things on a piece of paper once a week. That's all they did, once a week, and said, these are the things that I can be grateful for. They said that they could quantify better health, better uh, academics. They did better in relationships. I mean, they could uh, quantify all these things in their life that made these folks uh, just live life better. I mean, no surprise that the Bible has a lot to say about being a thankful person because the Bible recognizes that that's just not only something that'll make our lives more pleasant. uh, It's really something that makes our lives more righteous. You see, being a thankful person is not just about uh, making friends and influencing people. Uh, Being grateful or thankful really strikes at the heart of what Christians are called to be. It is our job description. In a very real sense, you can't be a righteous, godly person unless you can be picked out of the lineup as a grateful, appreciative, thankful person. They're to go in Scripture hand in hand. And here's how to do it. Here's the prescription. It's found in Colossians chapter 4, verse number 2. It all comes down to our prayer life. That is the catalyst for it. That is what it's all about. It's when Christians say, I'm going to be devoted to prayer. I'm going to stay alert in it. My mind's going to be engaged in it. And I'm going to be in it. The last word in Colossians 4, 2, I'm going to be thankful. My prayers are going to be seasoned with thanksgiving. You see, around Thanksgiving time, a lot of people in the world talk about being thankful, but they're thankful in a general sense. You ever notice that? It's just, you know, yeah, I'm thankful. But you see, Christians are called not to be generally thankful. They're called to be thankful in a very specific sense, in that they can go directly to a person and that they specifically, meaningfully, in a detailed way, they say to God, thank you. And, and, and they detail the things in a, in a verbal way that they're thankful for. That's what prayer is all about. That's a big part of praying according to Scripture. It is thanking God for all that He's done. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 13 as we try to explore how to inject this element into our prayer life that if we do, it will not only please God, it will uh, transform our personality. What a great thing. The benefits of thanksgiving, making it a daily habit. Forget the weekly part. Let's just make it a daily part of our lives itemize and specifically express our gratitude for things that God is doing in our lives and in our world. Romans chapter 13 moves it from a little bit more of a uh, comfortable place to a little bit more of an uncomfortable place for some people. You see, because even in the UC Davis study that they did, they made the distinction between being thankful as just a uh, favor and uh, being thankful because uh, I'm indebted to someone. And they said, well, one is preferred over the other. And yet Scripture says, listen, you can't really be motivated to be thankful the way God wants you to. So you recognize it's not just being polite. It's about being right. It's not just about uh, uh, preventing a life that's unpleasant. It's about preventing a sense of injustice. Because if we understand God and we rightly understand ourselves, we recognize it's not just something that's nice to do, it is something that uh, He deserves. It is something that we are required to do. So let's at least start there before we go any further. Look at Romans chapter 13 as it's put in a financial context, which for a lot of us is, uh, has a little more teeth to it, right? So here it is, verse 7, so we can understand it. It says, give everyone what you owe him. Notice that context of owing someone. If you owe taxes, then then pay your taxes. If you owe revenue, then then pay your revenue. If you owe respect, then you better pay respect. If it's honor, then uh, then pay the honor. Even that English word honor in in the English language, we connect with words that have the sense of what this is getting at. We use the word in, in English honorarium. 
honorarium. If, if someone comes and speaks at a school or even at a church, we might give them a, a check, an honorarium. We might say, we want to honor your giving of your time and your talents and your knowledge to us. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you something, a token of our thanks, an honorarium. We're going to say thanks. Thanks for that gift to us, and here is, here is some payback. I mean, that's the context here. There is a sense in which there are those who give to us, and we are to give back. If we owe them honor, then we ought to pay them honor. We ought to give the honorarium. The honorarium is never something that we can, we can do in a, in a clean, legal, quid pro quo sense. God gives us, I can't give him back in kind, but I can give him an honorarium. I can say thank you. And if there's anyone that's due honor, see, it's God. See, you respect, yes, and all the rest, but, but let's just focus on that honor part. He deserves honor. He needs to be recognized for what he's done. If you're in Romans already, turn back to the first chapter, and you'll see that the, the problem with ingratitude is a moral problem of not recognizing that God is God and that he is the giver of all things. See, it all gets down to that. If God is really God, then he deserves gratitude because he's the giver of everything. When we fail to see that, it is the mother of all sins. I mean, it really is the root of all kinds of, of, of problems in this world. Romans chapter 1, verse number 18, begins this really dark, dreary section of Romans that talks about God's wrath. It talks about it, in a sense, in, in the present tense, as though it's already happening, what we call sometimes in grammar this prophetic uh, 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 present. It's something that's going to happen. It's so sure that he depicts it as it's already happening, the wrath of God being revealed from heaven against all the godsness, this is Romans 1.18, and the wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. How did he do it? Well, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, things like his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. The point is, God has put us in such a world designed with beauty and order and symmetry and mathematics and all these things that we can look at and analyze with a telescope under a microscope. We can look at a sunset. We say, this is not the, the result of chaotic, you know, time plus chance. That's our garages, right? That's not the world we live in. The world we live in is, I mean, this is ordered. This is something God has created. And the Bible says, it ought to be clear for us to see that God is, is God. And that we are in a place that he has made. We are his creatures and we owe him some thanks. And yet the problem is, verse 21, although they knew God, they just opened their eyes, they could see it. They neither glorified him as God, the supplier and sustainer of all things, nor, here it is, gave thanks to him. See, there's the, the, the problem, the deprivation. They didn't thank him. They didn't recognize that he's the giver of everything, that is the maker and sustainer of life. And because of that, it says in this passage that all of a sudden their thinking then becomes futile. Their, their foolish hearts become dark. That's a poetic way of talking about sin. And if you haven't read this passage lately, you can read it this afternoon and see one thing after the next, after the next, after the next. He gets into some vile, gross, immoral things in this passage. But it stems from the crux of it. The foundation of it all is people that don't recognize God as the giver and creator of all things and don't give him thanks. It is a moral issue, you see. Now, it would be nice to say, well, yeah, I'm giving thanks to God just because, you know, he likes it and it's nice and polite. But in reality, we give thanks to God because he deserves it. If you're taking notes, jot it down like this. Number one on your outline, we need to realize that God deserves more gratitude. I say more because we need to recognize we need to pick up the slack in this world. I mean, your neighbor, your co-workers, you know, the people in, in San Clemente that are walking the beach right now are, are probably not spending a whole lot of time thanking God. And yet the Bible says, listen, that's our job. Even as 1 Peter says, we are called to proclaim the praises or the excellencies of the one who called us. That is our job description. And he deserves it, and so we give it. You see, it's one thing to run into a guy on the, in, in the patio this afternoon with his donut and, and coffee in his hand who wants to complain about everything. You might meet one, I don't know, maybe not today, but you, you have a guy out there, you know, complaining about my job and I don't like the weather, I don't like my, my house, I don't like my neighborhood, I don't care for my wife, don't care much for my kid. You know, on and on they go, rah, 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 complaining. And you can meet a guy like that and say, oh, hurry and get this conversation over with. And, uh, you know, hey, bummer, sorry to hear that, uh, whatever, okay. And you're on to the next person, right? Find me someone else. But listen, it doesn't offend you the way it offends you when you go home and your kid says to you, hey, I don't like my house, I don't like my room, I don't like my bike, I don't like my brother, I don't like what we had for dinner last night. You know, 
Yeah, I take that a little more personally. It's my house. You're a guest in it. I don't know if you realize that. You're not paying the, the mortgage. You know, the, the dinner, we served it up for your brother happens to be my other son. You know, listen, ingrate, right? You got it. You need a major mind altering thing to happen to you because you don't understand. I give you this. And for you to act like that, even as Shakespeare wrote in King Lear, you know, there's nothing worse than a thankless child. See, because he is the recipient of all these things. It goes from being unpleasant, that's the guy on the patio, to unjust. It's unjust. See, I give. And because I give and provide you with everything personally, I got a problem when you don't thank me. When you replace thanks and gratitude and appreciation with, with ingratitude and complaining and negativity. See, and if God is really who he says he is, then all of us owe him gratitude. And therefore, ingratitude becomes a real major moral problem. That's why Jesus, who seems so, you know, compassionate and so magnanimous in so many passages, ends up in passages like Luke 17, and he heals ten lepers, and only one comes back to thank him. And instead of think, thinking, well, you know, at least someone came back, thanks very much, you're welcome. Instead of being real nice and understanding, do you remember what Jesus said? Do you remember what Jesus, he heals ten, one comes back to thank him, and he asks them this rhetorical question. He said, where are the other nine? You remember that? Where are the other nine? He said, did I not heal ten? Well, now, that's an amazing thing. Because Jesus shows us right there that if he is the giver of all things, it is not an issue of being pleasant or kind or nice. It is an issue of indebtedness. We owe him our gratitude. And if our day is not spent today, it punctuated by, by prayers of thank you, thank you, thank you then we're not doing our job. And it is, an, it is not fair. Something's wrong with that equation when we don't say thanks to God. It is so critically important that we say, God, thank you. And when we do, the benefits come rushing in. Let's go to Psalm 100. I want to show you how pleasant it is to respond to our obligation. Some people like the, the study I read from UC, they think, well, if it's an obligation, then it's not really good. Psalm 100. Psalm 100. I want to show you it is good. It's great. This is not a burdensome obligation. This is not a burdensome command. Man, if we could all just get it this week and say, no, we're going to be characterized by appreciation. We're going to see, say thank you to God twice as much this week as we did last week. Here are some of the things that go with it. Look at these great words like joy and gladness. Psalm 100, verse 1, shout for joy to Yahweh all the earth. It's contagious too, by the way. Verse 2, worship Yahweh with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Now, that's a group of people that you want, you want to hang out with. Note, note, note this, what they didn't get in, in Romans 1, verse 3. Know that Yahweh is God. It is He who made us. He's our creator. We are His. He owns us. We are His people. We're accountable to Him, and we are the sheep of His pasture. He feeds us. He provides for us. As Acts 17 says, in Him we live and move and exist. Or as he says later, He gives us life and breath and everything else. Isn't that a great line? God gives us life and breath and everything else. Or as Colossians 1 says, it says, in Christ, all things hold together. If Christ were to turn his back for one minute, all the molecules in your body would scatter and head for the walls of this room. And the Bible says, no, he holds it all together. He holds it all together. And read some things on quantum mechanics or physics and all that wild stuff, and you'll see there is a mystery to the whole structure of our universe. And the Bible says, you know, it's Christ who keeps it all together. And the Bible says, listen, if Christ were to just turn his back for one second, we'd just be obliterated. And the Bible says, man, thank God for that. He's the, the, the shepherd of, of our lives. Inter so what do we do? Verse 4, I love it. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. It ought to characterize us. His courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For Yahweh is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues from one generation to the next and all generations. Look at God. He gives and gives and gives and gives. So what should be the characterization of his people? We, we thank him. Our lives are characterized by joyful, glad thanksgiving. Could we use a little bit of that in a day like ours, and even in a church like ours? Man, we could use a lot more of that. Let's do it. Why? Because he deserves it. He deserves more of it than he's getting. Would you agree with that? He deserves a lot more credit and thanks for the good things he does than he's getting. Now, sometimes that's hard for us to see because we miss the reality of God giving us what we do not deserve. See, the Bible paints a different picture than the average person you know, walking on the beach this morning. The average person out there in the world thinks, you know, when I got bad things happen in my life, I got something to complain about. 
Because they think, some weird, you know, sinful, skewed thinking, they think, because I deserve better. You ever heard people say that? You know, I deserve better. We deserve better. I deserve a better life than this. And look at what's happening. I got to lay down. I deserve better. Well, in Scripture, it's totally reversed. See, the Christians ought to be filled with thanksgiving, regularly, incessantly saying thanks, because they recognize, they recognize, like no other group of people, that they don't deserve better. See, they realize that, that Romans 6.23 is true. The wages of sin is death. See, and most of you are still breathing here in this room. We're breathing not only physically, but most of us in this room, I trust, are redeemed. We're spiritually alive. If we are physically alive and spiritually alive, then we are sinners who aren't getting what we deserve for the present moment. See, if we have a relationship with Christ, we're guaranteed that we'll never get what we deserve. And we don't deserve better. We deserve worse. Here's how Jesus described it. We deserve to be cast into outer darkness where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. And instead, he says, I'll, I'll let you enjoy another sunset. I'll give you another day of life. I'll let you eat the food of this planet that I made. I'll let you breathe the air in, in this world that, that I created. I'll, I'll let you not only that, if you're a Christian, I'll let you get a cancellation of every bad thing you've ever done, and I'll give you a guarantee that you'll live in a perfect place forever, and I'll protect you from all harm in that place for, forevermore. And, and I'll give you that. I'll promise you. Matter of fact, I know there's a price that needs to be paid for that, but I'll pay it myself. I'll put a representative in human form, the second person of the Godhead, to live on planet Earth, to die as a substitute, that if you just trust in my son, I'll tell you what, I'll forgive you of every debt and I'll let you live eternally in heaven. And you know what? I'll just let you do that. And today, if you have a cold, if you're sick, if there's a problem, you know, I just want you to remember there's a lot of stuff you're getting from me that you don't deserve. It's called grace. It's called grace. The Greek word uh, for grace is charis, charis. Well, the word for thanksgiving is you charis. Tia, you charis tia. The you and the tia are, are sandwiched between the root word, which is where we get the word thankful. And right in the center of that Greek word is the word charis. You cannot, in the original text, read the word thanksgiving or thankful without seeing right in the center of the word the word grace, because that's what it's all about. We are remembering the grace of God. We are thanking God because we get all this good stuff that we do not deserve. You know the old Sunday school definition of, of grace? It is God's unmerited or unearned favor, His goodness, His blessing to us that we, that we just don't deserve. It's grace. December 15th, yesterday was my son's uh, fifth birthday. And since I was preaching last night, we had a party for him Friday night. And it was at the bowling alley, and it, he invited all his, you know, little five-year-old friends, and, and we had this, you know, typical five-year-old party. And it was going just great until halfway through, he leans over to me, and he says, Dad? I said, yeah. He says, I'd like to lay down. I said, what? You want to lay down? What are you talking about? I said, I want to lay down. And I could see, you know, not looking quite normal here. Uh, so I call mom over, and there's, you know, chaotic uh, jungle stuff going on. There's, you know, five-year-olds everywhere. And, and uh, I say, Mom, you better check on this kid. She takes him off to the bathroom, and you know what happens, right? He loses it in the bathroom Blech, all over the place. I didn't see it, but, uh, but I heard all about it. <laughs> He comes back, he's a little paler, he's a little weaker, he's still, though, wanting to enjoy the party, so he's trying. We get up there, we get the little, you know, tablecloth, the bowling, you know, pinned cake and all that stuff, and he's, he's, uh, he's trying to enjoy this thing, and all the kids, what's great about the party, of course, from a five-year-old perspective, is they all bring these, these presents, and here's this pile of presents, and he's starting to open these presents, and he leans back to me one more time, he says, Dad? I said, yeah. He said, I'd like to lay down again. <laughs> So uh, I, I said, Mom. Um. <laughs> so Carlin comes over, takes him to the bathroom. Sure enough, he throws up. He, now he's coming like he's just wrenched, and he comes back, and he, okay, he's trying to enjoy the party. <laughs> and what was funny is literally he ran out of energy to open another present. He started opening. He just couldn't do it. So, of course, we wrapped him up, put him in the car. He decided to throw up again in the car on the way home. And... Uh, <laughs> We got him home and, you know, gave him this bath. We put him, snuggled him up on the couch, and we tried to, you know, get, you know calm him. And what was funny is, was, as his strength kind of built up between uh, vomit sessions, uh, <laughs> which, by the way, totaled 10 in about 12 hours, between his sessions in, in, in the bathroom, most of them were in the bathroom, between those sessions, he would say, 
isn't, isn't there another present? Uh, <laughs> so we'd bring him a present, and we'd say, yeah, there's another present. You didn't get a bottle. I'm telling you, it wasn't until 6.30 in the morning that he finally finished opening all of his presents. He'd open like one every few hours, right? And he was up all night. So it, it, what was hilarious about this all is here is a guy who's just physically dying, right? His little body, I can't even imagine how they, whatever came out of him actually fit inside of him, right? I'm thinking, how can you still even be conscious? And, and yet, he's, here's, his, here's his philosophy of life. It, isn't there another present on the table? And I thought to myself, the problem with some of us with our complaining and moaning and whining and critical negativity, is that when, as soon as we get sick, as soon as we lose our job, as soon as we have a relational problem, as soon as something goes wrong, we stop remembering there's a lot of gifts left on the table. And, and God is trying to say to us, your life is grace. It is filled with grace. And there, you, might have, you might have the worst week of your life, but I tell you what, if you worked at it, you could make a list of gifts that are still on the table and some of them I realize you can't open in this life. They'll be opened in eternity, but we have a lot to be thankful for. And I want you, like my little boy, to sit there this week, even if you're hurting, and say, you know what, isn't there another uh, present on, on the table for me? And God will say, yeah. And when you get it, do what my wife does. Every time there's a party, she takes her pin out and she writes it down. Why? Because we know that what we want to do is we want to express our gratitude for those that gave it. Make a list. Not many of us are good at, at improvisation. We don't Im improv very well. We don't improvise very well. We, we are, uh, uh, you know, I used to play in some, uh, some jazz groups. I know that's hard to believe. Uh, I don't have a goatee or anything, but I did. And, and what I would find is you'd have some great musicians that would come join our group. I mean, really good. I had a trumpet player who could play every note, man, that you, you put in front of him. But when you said, okay, it's your turn, uh, let's, here you go, the guy couldn't improvise. He didn't have what it, what it took. Now, I realize there's very few that are good at, at, at improvising. They, they're not great at it. And I think in our prayer lives, we think we're all just virtuosos, that we can go in and just spontaneously, you know, just praise God for things. I'm telling you what, I think we need to put a little prep into our prayer. I put it this way in your outline, number two. We need to ponder God's grace before we pray. We need to start saying, now, God, there's a lot here that you've given me. There are a lot of gifts on the table. Let me make a list. Let me see the gifts, focus on the gifts, and let me say thank you for the gifts. And I need to prepare for my praying. How many of us think about prepping for prayer? We, we usually don't. If my prayers are going to be filled with thanks and thanksgiving and, and gratitude, I should probably do some prep before I pray. There was a gal with a very difficult childhood. And in her teens, I read this story, she would sit on the bus with a spiral notebook and she would write out things that she was thankful for. She didn't have friends, people despised her. She was one of those outsiders, those loners. And she sat there and kept writing through her entire teenage years. Well, finally, when she was an adult in her 20s or 30s, she ended up publishing a book. Her first book was entitled 14,000 Things to Be Happy About. Because all she did was she kept remembering all the blessings and gifts on the table. And she said, there's a lot to be thankful for. And you know what? That one book has blessed so many people. As they read these things from the, from the time she was 14, 15 years old, that she started recognizing were worth a thank you. And people said, you know what? There's a lot that we can be thankful for. I don't know what you're going through, but make a list. Make a list of all the things that God gives you. It, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things that provoke our conversation to be, to be negative and critical. But there's a whole lot that ought to provoke us to be thankful. Why? Because my life, no matter how bad it is, against the backdrop of hell, it starts to look pretty good. You know what I'm saying? Think about it. Against the backdrop of what I truly deserve, I'm looking pretty good where I'm at, regardless of how the weather is this week. I'm looking pretty darn good against the backdrop of outer darkness and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You know what I'm talking about? It's time for us to say thanks. God, thank you. We need to itemize the grace of God. We need to think about the grace of God. We need to ponder the gifts of God. And then we can step into prayer. And when you step into prayer, do what the scripture constantly does. Be specific. If you're still in the book of Psalms, turn to Psalm 136. Psalm 136. Psalm 136 is a great psalm about the loving kindness of God. The Hebrew word hesed, it means a, a faithful, consistent, uh, reliable love. It's always there. It's always giving. It's always generous. And the Bible says, listen, we need to thank God for it. And here's the pattern of the Old Testament, Psalm 136. It's all about thanking God for, for his enduring love. 
Look at verse 1. Give thanks to Yahweh, for He is good. His love endures forever. You see that? Give thanks to God, the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To Him who alone does great wonders, His love endures forever. Who by understanding made the heavens, His love endures forever. He spread out the earth upon the waters, His love endures forever. Who made the great lights, His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, His love endures forever. The moon and the stars to govern the night, His love endures forever. Do you see the pattern here? Here's a, a single attribute of God that the psalmist wants to praise Him for and thank Him for. But you know what? Every time he wants to pause and think, here's another, here's another manifestation of that. God's love, it's so fun. Here's another manifestation of that. Just one single thing. He goes on and on and on. He talks about deliverance from Israel. He talks about the enemies that wanted to snuff out Israel and how God defended them. He talks about how God constantly provides for them. He frees them from enemies. He gives them food to eat. And then he wraps it up again. Verse 26, at the end of the psalm, says, give thanks to the God of heaven. Why? His love endures forever. See, the problem with some of our prayers of thanksgiving is they're so general. Some of us are in such ruts of giving him thanks for the same chicken casserole, you know, for the 20,000th time. How many times has he heard his bow our heads and thank him for a meal? But you know what? We need to start being more detailed. We need to be broader. We need to say, you provide for us, but let's think of some other ways you provide for us. You ever get a thank you card that just says thank you on the front and has a name on the inside? I mean, that's not, I mean, that's, in, that's the round file material, right? Thank you, you know, Dan. Well, for, you know, what? What's that about? We get a thank you card from someone. It'd sure be nice to know what for and what did it mean to you. Do you ever get a thank you card that you open up and it's got a folded piece of lined paper in it and they've taken time in small print to go through what you've done for them and say, this is what it meant to me. I just want to elaborate on it. I just want to. Those are the cards that get propped up on the desk. That is the note that gets cherished in the top drawer of your desk. Because you say, you know what, that person's heart is just, man, I, I feel the gratitude in what that person says. And some of us are so brief, we're so, God, thanks for blessing my life. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my health. Thank you for my job. Uh, okay, got some requests for you, God. And what God would love to hear us do is what we love to hear people do. What? Just elaborate on that, would you? Thank you for my family. How many God's, times has God heard that from you? Great. Why are you thankful for that? What difference does that make to you? What do you appreciate about the personality of your youngest child? What is it that you want to say thank you for? How can you say my life has been so blessed by that? Thank him with specificity. Number three, be specific when you say thanks on your alley. Number three, be specific when you tell him thanks. If you're going to say thanks to God, he doesn't want just this generality. The scriptural pattern is keep on telling him. Keep on saying, see the new facets of how God is blessing you. Look at the gift from another perspective. Go, go back to Psalm uh, 96. We're still in Psalms. Here's a good little banner verse for us as it comes down to specific continual thank yous. I love this. And it was kind of confusing to me at first. And early as a Christian, I read this and thought, what's, what's, his, what's his deal here? But it makes sense in light of the rest of Scripture. The more I understood the Bible, I recognized this totally makes sense. Verse 1, it says, sing to Yahweh a new song. Now, my question is, what's wrong with the old ones? You know what I'm saying? It doesn't, why do you want a new one? Why do you need a new song? Why do we need to sing a new song to God? Well, I, th I think it's clear as we move on here. Sing to Yahweh, all the earth. Sing to, to Yahweh, praise His name, proclaim His salvation. Look at this, day after day. And I don't think it's just the same thing we're saying over and over. We're saying it in new ways. We're seeing new facets of it. Look at the next one, verse 3. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among the people. Is that stopped? Did He stop doing marvelous things? Did He stop giving gifts? Did manifestations of His salvation or His grace cease in your life? No. Then we need, we need to say Here's a new aspect of it. Here's a new facet of it. Here's a new detail. Here's a new thing I'd like to say thank you for. You know, I looked at salvation from a whole new way this week, and here's what I'd like to, here's what I appreciate about what I discovered this week. See, every day filled with specific, meaningful thanksgiving. Those are the cards God keeps. You know what I'm saying? Those are the ones he cherishes. That's the kind of thanksgiving that he enjoys. Make sure we make this our, our passion, especially this season of the year. You might be out at the mall this week shopping for people and doing some last-minute stuff to prepare for, for Christmas. But please don't forget whose birth we're trying to celebrate. It's his party, if you will, and, and, and you need to give him a gift 
You're not going to find it at Crate and Barrel, you know. You're not going to be able to pick up something for him at Robinson's May. If you want to shop and buy and give something to Christ this Christmas, give him a grateful heart. Give him an appreciative attitude. Give him a disposition that is filled with chronic thank yous that are meaningful, specific, detailed, and your heart is there. And you say, God, I just want to say thanks. Could we as a church offer him our congregation this Christmas season and say to him, God, I, I just want to let you know that in this little corner of Christendom, you, you got a group of people that are offering up continual sacrifices of thanksgiving, coming out of, out of our mouths, the fruit of our lips, just thank you, God. Thank you. Not generally, specifically. And let me give you a list of things I'm thankful for. Let's, let's do that this holiday season. Pray with me, please. God, help us. Surrounded by, uh, frankly, by uh, really ungrateful people at our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our, in our world. We just, you know, we don't start the newscast at night with a prayer of thanksgiving for sustaining our, our world for one more day. All we do is we look at the, the, the negative, and God, there's a lot of stuff that needs our attention, and the negative needs our prayer requests and our petitions. But Lord, before we even get tangled up in all of that, God, let our hearts be set just ablaze with a sense of gratitude for your gifts. You give us so much. God, and against the backdrop of what we deserve, man, our lives are filled with gifts. Let us say, man, there's a gift on the table. It needs to be opened, enjoyed. We need to celebrate it. We need to thank God for it. You know what? There's a lot that we can praise God for. Help us to do that, that we might offer to you a gift, one individual at a time, of a heart that is more thankful this week than it's ever been before, regardless of our circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.